I'd like to talk about the fun topic, essentially blockchain inspired protocols where game theory meets cryptography. This is joint work with Hilbert Chang, Kamin Chan, and Ting Wan. Let me begin with the motivating example that comes from real life. This is not uncommon in cryptography community. You write a paper and you discover there's another concurrent work uh, that has identical results. This has happened to me a couple of times. In fact, it, has, it happened to my first ever crypto paper in grad school. And then it happened again in 2013. And this time the two papers even had the same title. So both papers were submitted to your crypto 14 and the PC recommended hard merge. And here comes the real challenge. Who should go to the conference to present the merge paper? A straw man solution to this problem is for me and Shafi, who's co-author on the other paper, to deal it out. But we can do better. Uh, why not run a coin toss protocol? In fact, this is what we actually did. Coin toss was first proposed in Blum's groundbreaking work in 1983. Uh, the way it works is the following. So in this example, we are using a blockchain as a public bulletin board. First, Shafi and I each um, select a random bit. We both commit to our bits. And then we open our commitments. And these are the open bits. We will compute the XR of the openings. And, and let's say Shafi prefers zero and I prefer one, right? So in this case, the XR is one and therefore I win. And uh, you know, this is also what actually happened. Uh, uh, our group, uh, in fact, my former postdoc went and presented the paper. Okay, so I may be somewhat concerned here because Shafi you know, may be malicious and maybe she'll deviate from the protocol because this is a commitment-based protocol. The only possible deviation is essentially a barting, right? You can open your commitment wrongly, but that's the same as a barting too. Um, it turns out in this case, it's not a big issue because if Shafi aborts, we can say she just automatically forfeits and I'm going to win anyway. So if she aborts, the outcome is defined to be one. Okay, so how do we design, how do we define a coin toss protocol? Uh, there are two requirements. Correctness is defined in the most natural manner. Uh, basically, if both parties are honest, we want the outcome to be a random coin. Uh, how do we define fairness? Uh, the standard line of work on multi-party computation uh, considers a very strange notion of fairness, and I'll call this strong fairness in this talk. Strong fairness requires that even if Shafi aborts, I would nonetheless output a completely unbiased coin. This is unfortunately known to be impossible in a two-party setting or in a multi-party setting where half or more than half of the parties can be corrupt. And, and this was proven in an elegant uh, paper by Cleve back in 1986. Uh, and now you may find this strange, right? Since there's an impossibility, how can Blum's protocol work? The key observation is that Blum's protocol actually achieves a strictly weaker notion of fairness, and I'll call it game theoretic fairness. In the protocol we've seen, uh, it's not like Shafi cannot bias the coin. She can indeed bias the coin by aborting, but it'll just end up hurting herself and benefiting me. Essentially, we are considering rational players who care about maximizing some utility function. And game theoretic fairness requires that no matter what Shafi does, she cannot benefit herself or hurt me. Uh, this also means Shafi's best response is to play honestly and therefore honest behavior is an equilibrium. Since Blum's protocol achieves game theoretic fairness in a two-party setting, a very natural question is, can we achieve game theoretic fairness in multi-party coin toss too? Um, so it may not be completely clear what, multi, uh, what the formulation is. I'll explain that in a little bit. When we first started working on this problem back in 2018, we were surprised to find that uh, no work has considered uh, this question. Um, essentially, the whole line of work on multi-party computation considered the strong fairness notion, even though actually, you know, the first coin toss paper, Blum's coin toss, in fact, achieved uh, game theoretic fairness. Before explaining our results, let me mention that under some strong assumptions, we can have uh, some trivial or immediate solution, and these are not the settings we are interested in. First, if we have honest majority, we can just use honest majority multi-party computation with fairness and guarantee output. 
this can be accomplished in constant number of rounds. Uh, however, in decentralized blockchain settings, honest majority is often not a reasonable assumption. Like let's say you have a smart contract and people are entering, um, you know, playing with their pseudonyms. The pseudonyms are often cheap to make up, right? So it could be like 90% of the pseudonyms are controlled by a single entity. Another trivial solution is essentially to assume the problem away. Suppose there's a trusted setup that can toss the coin for us. Uh, or maybe the trusted setup just picks some uh, pseudorandom seed and whenever we need a coin, we can stretch the seed to get more pseudorandomness out of it. However, in a decentralized setting, often we don't want to trust any single entity. And moreover, we want the coin to be unpredict unpredictable in advance. With this in mind, let's refi refine the problem. We are actually asking, um, assuming corrupt majority and no setup assumptions, that is in the plain model, uh, can we achieve game theoretic fairness in multi-party coin toss? If we establish feasibility, then the next question we may care about is the efficiency of these protocols. And in this talk, we'll, we'll particularly care about uh, round complexity. Now, let me try to define the problem uh, more precisely. There are actually two formulations for game theoretic multi-party coin toss, and they're both very natural. In the first formulation, I want you to think of it as like binary roulette. So every player bets on either zero or one, and if their bet is the same as the outcome, then they win. So imagine everyone will put down one ether to enter the game, and then all of the winners will divide the pot, right? So that can be the utility function. Uh, now, in the second formulation, it's more like lottery, and it's the same as leader election. So we have n players, we want to elect the winner at random, um, and the winner will take the part of all bets. For this talk, I'm going to focus on the second formulation. I just want to quickly mention that in a couple other papers, we actually gave a complete uh, characterization of uh, the first uh, definition, essentially when it's feasible and when it's not feasible. So let's focus on the leader election definition. Uh, I want to reiterate the utility function here, right? As I said, the winner takes all, but we can easily rescale the utility and just simply assume the winner has utility one and everyone else has utility zero. So this is the utility function we will assume for the rest of the talk. Leader election has uh, quite a lot of applications in blockchain settings. Uh, so imagine there's a smart contract and it's looking for workers to provide verifiable computation service or provide, let's say, you know, VDF service. And, and whoever provides the service can earn rewards. So that's why everyone's eager to enter. They're competing to become uh, the leader. Okay. So before talking about our protocol, let me first uh, give you a, a simple folklore solution. And then you have something concrete in mind. Uh, okay, so imagine we have these cryptographers in the room, they're trying to elect the PC chair of the next crypto conference. And of course, being PC chair is a lot of work, but say everyone's eager to serve the community, so they all want to uh, get elected. Uh, we are going to pair them up, and every pair will run Blum's coin toss to elect the winner. The winner survives to the next round, and then the winners get paired up, uh, and then they compete against each other using Blum's protocol until a final winner is elected. In general, you know, you can do it in a tree-like fashion and the whole protocol will complete in log n number of rounds. So, so, you know, it's actually interesting to see how to do it in better than log n rounds. And that's what we are going to talk about later in the talk. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that if anyone aborts or maybe if anyone opens their commitment wrongly, right, which is the same as aborting, um, you automatically forfeit and you are kicked out. Uh, if you look at this tournament tree protocol, it achieves a very strong notion of game theoretic fairness. Uh, it achieves uh, the following two things. First, no coalition is able to increase its own utility, no matter how it deviates from the protocol. Um, because, you know, as I mentioned, when you abort, you automatically forfeit, so it never makes sense for you to abort. Uh, we also want a second property, that is no coalition can harm any honest individual. 
Uh, the second property is also important. For example, let's say I'm providing verifiable computation service to a smart contract in exchange for rewards. Uh, it may be in my interest to monopolize the ecosystem. Therefore, I may want to drive, uh, drive away the competition and make the smaller players go away. Even if in the short term, it may cost me something to perform this attack, I'm still interested in harming you know, smaller players. Uh, and if a coalition can harm individual players, it'll create this incentive for small players to join the system. If a protocol satisfies these properties, then honest behavior is an equilibrium, right? Because if I join the system and everyone else is behaving honestly, my best response is also to behave honestly. And, and this is true no matter what my goal is. Like I may be selfish and profit seeking. I may be malicious and trying to harm others in an attempt to monopolize the ecosystem. I may be paranoid and just wanting to defend myself in the worst possible scenario. No matter what my goal is, like I just shouldn't have incentive to deviate. Okay, so we know game theoretic fairness is possible um, for leader election in log n rounds. And this follows from the tournament tree protocol. Now, the interesting question is, can we asymptotically improve the round complexity to you know, something little or log n? Uh, again, remember we are uh, assuming corrupt majority and no setup. And also going forward, uh, whenever I say fair, I automatically mean game theoretic fair. Okay, so what's the first thing we got to try, right? I mean, the most naive idea is to take the tournament tree protocol and compress it to two rounds, right? Remember in the tournament tree protocol, we have log n rounds and, and every round you'll commit and you'll reveal, but now let's just say we commit uh, the coins for all rounds in one shot, and then we reveal all the coins in one shot, and then we compute the winner using the tree-like fashion. Uh, so I want you to think, you know, would something like this work? Uh, well, not surprisingly, this, this naive approach is completely broken. And that's why the problem is interesting. Uh, so here's an attack. Let's say Shafi and Alessandro, they form a coalition and they have a definitive strategy of winning. Uh, and the way it works is they're going to each commit uh, zero, zero and one, one respectively, right? So, so there are two coins, one coin corresponding to each round in the original protocol. And now they're going to wait till the other bracket opens their coin. Um, and that at this moment, they can choose one of them to abort and the other one will survive. And they can do so in a way uh, that allows them to win definitively. So this brings us to our results. I'll talk about these results at a high level and then I'll go into details. We have good news and bad news, right? So the bad news is that um, if we restrict ourselves to protocols that are similar in structure to the tournament tree protocol, then log n rounds is the best you can do. So what do I mean by similar in structure to the tournament tree protocol? So in the tournament tree protocol, right? Remember it works by commit and then Im immediately reveal. You commit to something in the immediate next round you reveal and this repeats for log n times. And if we restrict ourselves to this commit and immediately review model, then you know it's pretty hopeless and we have to suffer from log n rounds. I want you to think of this lower bound as a sanity check in protocol design rather than a deal breaker because who says we have to tie our hands like this? And the reason why we came up with this lower bound is more because like initially we were trying protocols that are similar to tournament tree, but you know, soon enough we realized that this is kind of like a dead end. Okay. Um, and this brings us to our main upper bound result, right? So we show that if you are willing to make a couple of relaxations, then we can indeed overcome this log n barrier. Uh, so first we have to relax the fairness notion to approximate fairness. Um, it, on this slide, it says little O1 fairness. I'll explain what that means in just a little bit. And second, uh, you know, we cannot restrict ourselves to the commit and immediately reveal model, right? We, now are willing to work with the uh, standard cryptographic assumptions that like we can use crypto in a general way. Um, so in this talk, I only have time to talk about the upper bound. I don't have any time to show you the lower bound proof. So to understand this result, I first have to explain what is approximate fairness 
And then I'll tell you what crypto we need and you know, how the construction works. So first, what do I mean by approximate fairness? It's similar to the notions we saw earlier, but now allowing a small uh, epsilon approximation factor. So a protocol is said to be epsilon fair if the following two things hold. And I'm always going to assume that the players are polynomially bounded in terms of computation power. So first we want that no coalition can increase its expected utility by more than an epsilon factor. Second, we want to make sure that no coalition that's uh, up to one minus epsilon times ending size can reduce any honest individual's utility by more than epsilon. And so, you know, in our actual theorem, we can work with epsilon that's, let's say, little O of one. Um, before this talk, I'm often going to use 1% for epsilon just for simplicity. So this means, you know, the coalition can be as large as 99%. And we want to make sure the coalition cannot increase its own utility by more than 1%. It cannot harm an honest individual by more than 1%. Um, and it's also important to note that this epsilon slack is a multiplicative notion. Um, for example, let's look at the second notion, that is you cannot harm others noticeably. Uh, normally, if everyone plays honestly, then any single individual's utility is one over n in expectation. Uh, so with approximate fairness, what we want is that no coalition up to 99% in size can reduce any individual's utility by 1%. This means any honest individual should have utility at least one minus epsilon over n, right? So you can see this, uh, uh, normalized it's a multiplicative notion uh, and this kind of multiplicative notion is the most natural in many applications like for instance you could be playing some game repeatedly and in these cases the absolute value of the utility like um, doesn't mean very much so you you know it's uh, natural to like normalize the game and and uh, use this multiplicative notion Again, our philosophy here is um, to achieve incentive compatibility. Now we have this like tiny, you know, epsilon slack, right? So if you deviate, maybe you are able to do just a little bit better, um, epsilon better, but the relative gain is so small, like it's just not worth the trouble. Uh, like if you deviate, you can get caught or exposed. Um, okay. In this talk, I'm going to stick with these simple notions I've mentioned, but in our actual paper, we actually define an even better solution concept called epsilon uh, sequentially uh, fair. Uh, so I will very briefly mention about this at the end of the talk. Okay, I've explained what is approximate fairness before I jump into our construction. Let me mention that our result is actually parameterized. Uh, so here R means the wrong complexity, right? So for, for any R that's at least some constant times log log N, we can achieve roughly speaking two to the minus R fairness. Uh, so one thing to observe is that as number of rounds R increases, uh, the slack or the approximation factor will drop exponentially fast. So this is like a sharp curve. Okay, I, I'm going to next tell you how our construction works. At a very high level, we use a combination of extractors and honest majority uh, multi-party computation. Uh, so when you first see this, you should be surprised because you know, didn't I just tell you we are working with corrupt majority, right, majority coalitions. So how can honest majority MPC be useful in this setting? Um, but you'll see that in a little bit. Okay, so let's dive into the technical details of the construction. I'll first start with the straw man. Uh, the straw man scheme actually relies on a random oracle um, and it has a couple of flaws, but we are going to you know, fix these couple of flaws one by one and we can remove the random oracle at the end. Uh, and at the very end of the talk, I'll quickly mention uh, about this sequential fairness and then I'll conclude. So here's the blueprint that like we have a large number of players and uh, first we will, you know, this is a universe reduction technique. We will first, uh, sample a small committee that's poly in size. And then we will run the tournament tree protocol among the poly size committee. 
And because you know the committee is polylogging size, the tournament tree protocol will complete in log log n rounds. Uh, so what remains to be answered is how do we do this committee election? And we also want the committee election to complete in a small number of rounds. Okay, so let's see. Uh, first, here's a straw man approach. This approach is actually inspired by uh, proof of stake protocols like Snow White. Uh, imagine each player posts a random bit to the blockchain and the concatenation of all of these bits is fed into a random oracle, uh, let's say SHA-256, and then the outcome is used to elect a polylog size committee. Uh, okay. So from now on, I will assume that if anyone aborts, then their bit is just treated as a default bit zero. Let's think about what this protocol gives us. Imagine that the red, red players form a coalition. Uh, the coalition has some advantage over the honest players because they can wait until the honest players post their coins. They can look at the honest coins and then decide their own coins. This means they can try different combinations of their own coins. Um, by making queries to the random oracle multiple times, and then they can pick a combination that helps itself the most. Uh, recall that you know eventually we will elect a winner among the committee, right? So if the coalition wants to you know get elected, their best shot is to increase their representation in the committee. Like they should get as many seats as possible in the committee. So let's say this is the coalition's objective. Fortunately, we can prove that a, a coalition that controls any constant fraction of players cannot increase its representation on the committee noticeably more than its fair share. For example, suppose the coalition controls 99%, then in this case, you know, the committee uh, should also be roughly 90, 99% red uh, and not too much more. So this means that any coalition that controls a constant fraction of the players um, cannot benefit itself noticeably. Uh, and proving this is pretty straightforward. First, we can show, you know, for a single random oracle query uh, using a standard churn-up bound, and basically the probability that the committee is bad is negligibly small. And here a bad committee means that it's more than 99.1% red. Okay, now if the coalition is polynomially bounded, it can only make polynomially many random oracle queries. So we can just take a union bound over these polynomially many uh, random oracle queries. And, and we can conclude basically, except with negligible probability, um, the committee will be at most 99.1% red. Okay. So that was the good news, but the scheme has a couple of flaws. Uh, uh, the first problem is that a large coalition can actually harm a single individual. Uh, so the kind of trend up bound we saw, right? Um, it works for like a significantly large, uh, it works for like a large enough population, but it doesn't actually work um, for a, a single individual are a small population. And here, you know, we are worried about a single individual being harmed. And if you want to harm uh, an honest individual, you can do the same attack. You can wait until the honest uh, people post their coins, and then you can try different combinations of your own coins and pick one that excludes this single individual. So intuitively, you know, what's the intuition here? Like, it's easy for you to make sure a specific individual is either excluded or included, but if you wanna make sure that many honest people are excluded or many red players are included, then that's much harder. And for a similar reason, you know, we have the second flaw and basically a small coalition actually can benefit itself significantly. So at first sight, like you may be shocked, right? Because you know earlier I said a large coalition cannot benefit itself noticeably, but now I'm telling you a small coalition can benefit itself significantly. This seems really counterintuitive because you know it should somehow be easier to defend against a small coalition. 
But on the other hand, like if you think about it, we have a multiplicative notion of fairness, right? So for let's say a single individual, its normal utility is like just one over n. So even if it can increase its utility just by a tiny bit, let's say I can increase by one over n, I'm already doing twice better. And that's significant by our definition because anything more than one plus epsilon is considered significant. So in some sense, it's actually, you know, in this case, uh, maybe the small coalition is actually harder to defend against. And again, it's the same kind of attack. The small coalition can wait till honest people post their coins and then try different combinations of their own coins um, to increase their representation on the committee. So we are going to fix these problems one by one. And let's first begin with the, you know, the first problem. Um, a large coalition can harm a single honest individual. To fix this problem, our observation is that if you want to ex exclude some individual from the committee, you have to know the identity of the victim. And so our idea is to make sure, you know, you don't know the identity of the victim. And, and how does this work? So let's say every player, uh, they're not going to use their real identities uh, in the committee selection. They're going to pick a virtual ID at random. So they know their virtual ID, but other people don't. And now they can commit to their virtual ID. Here's a big envelope, but actually everyone's committing to its virtual ID separately. And we still run the same protocol, but the only difference here is that we are running this random Oracle-based committee selection on the virtual IDs instead. And, and only when we finish the virtual ID election, do people open their virtual IDs and now we find the reverse mapping and we can know, you know who actually lands in the committee. And then we just you know, round the tournament tree among the committee and elect the final winner. So there is actually a small subtlety here. Um, if you just do this, it turns out it doesn't work. And here's an attack, like let's say the coalition doesn't know honest people's uh, virtual IDs, but they do know their own virtual IDs, right? So they can place all of their virtual IDs, like they can um, pick uh, um, the same virtual ID, let's say. Every, every coalition member picks the same virtual ID and then and they can pick uh, their coins carefully to make sure that specific virtual ID is included in the committee. So this way, every uh, red player uh, can become part of the committee and that's bad. And to eliminate this attack, we are going to modify the rule just slightly. We are going to say, you know, your, your, this virtual ID is only elected into the committee if there's no collision with other virtual IDs. Uh, so if you are going to put your X in one basket and then make sure that basket is you know, elected, that's not going to work because it's just going to cause collision amongst yourselves. Uh, so if you introduce this fix, It'll almost work, except that you just have to make the virtual ID space a little bit larger to make the collision probability small enough. So I won't tell you the detailed parameters here, but essentially with this modification, uh, we can fix the first problem. And now we just have to focus on how to fix the second problem. A small coalition can benefit itself significantly. So how do we fix this problem? In fact, earlier, I already kind of gave away the solution, right? Because I told you, you know, our solution involves an honest majority MPC. And here is where we use the honest majority MPC. The idea is that, um, you know, players don't choose their own virtual IDs, right? So the reason that a coalition can help itself is because Every player knows their own virtual ID. Um, okay, so in order to make sure people don't know even their own virtual IDs, uh, we will have every player pick a random unmasked virtual ID, but this is not your final virtual ID. And to get your final virtual ID, you have to apply another masking permutation. And this masking permutation will be chosen using an honest majority MPC. 
So if the coalition is small, let's say less than 1%, and then, you know, the honest majority MPC has privacy, right? So the coalition has no idea what this mask implementation is, and therefore it doesn't have any idea what its own virtual IDs are. And so that's the idea. Uh, and now the question is, wh what happens with large coalitions? So for large coalitions, the honest majority MPC is completely broken. It doesn't have any security, but that doesn't matter because we can get fairness from like the first part of the construction, right? The argument we saw earlier, um, earlier we showed that you know, a large coalition cannot benefit itself noticeably. And that same argument still applies here, even with the new modifications. Okay, so when we combine these ideas, we can fix both of these flaws um, and the resulting scheme should work. Uh, and the only problem that remains is we still have a random oracle and we want to get rid of it. At a high level, we want to replace the random oracle with a combinatorial object called a sampler. And this is kind of equivalent to like a seeded extractor. Uh, but it's not just so simple as it turns out. We'll have to introduce some other changes to the protocol to make it work. One thing to keep in mind is that earlier, our proof relied on the fact that the coalition can only make polynomially many random oracle queries. But once we re replace the random oracle with the sampler, we'll have to make a combin combinatorial argument instead, like without any regard to the player's computational bounds. Unfortunately for this talk, I actually won't have time to uh, tell you how to get rid of the random oracle in details. So let me just skip to the end. Okay. Um, at a high level, in order to replace the random oracle with the sampler, we actually need to adopt a two-phase committee election strategy. So first we run a single iteration of FIGA's like spin protocol to elect what's called a preliminary committee. Um, but we are not running uh, the tournament tree protocol among the prelim preliminary committee. So the preliminary committee will then um, run a protocol just like the random Oracle based protocol we saw to elect the final committee. But of course now we want to replace random Oracle with the sampler. And finally, will run tournament tree among the final committee to elect the final leader. Uh, okay. So I'm going to ask you to read the paper for the details of the scheme as well as the proofs. Before I conclude, I want to say, you know, uh, I mentioned about sequential fairness, right? Uh, I'm just going to say a few words. At a high level, Epsilon fairness, which is the notion we saw, requires that a priori, before the protocol starts, the coalition has little incentive to deviate. But it could be that with some small but non-negligible probability, let's say epsilon over two probability, some bad event happens. Let's say, you know, with small probability, Alice steals Bob's uh, secret key. Um, and if this bad event happens, right, conditioned on the bad event happen, um, Alice does have incentive to deviate because in that case, he, maybe she can just steal Bob's Bitcoins. But because this bad event happens with let's say only epsilon over two probability, then a priori, Alice actually doesn't have a you know, noticeable incentive to deviate. Uh, so if we just use the current epsilon fairness notion, like it would sometimes fail to rule out um, undesirable protocols like this. And that's why we think epsilon sequential fairness is a better solution concept for approximate fairness. Uh, roughly speaking, the sequential notion requires that except with negligible probability, at no point in the protocol should you have noticeable incentive to deviate. Okay, so I'll just leave it at this. Please read the paper for the details. And um, what's interesting here is that this actually shows like even how to define approximate game theoretic fairness is non-trivial and requires careful considerations. Okay, finally, I want to conclude by saying that, you know, game theory meets crypto um, is much needed in decentralized blockchain applications, just like most blockchain ideas. In this space, actually industry is, you know, ahead of research. Um, 
in many cases, it's like it's not even clear how to model things or how to formulate the problem. And I personally think, you know, this is an exciting area that needs new scientific foundations. Uh, and also it needs like interdisciplinary uh, research. Thank you very much.